But I don't think you can imagine this being a local. Yeah, 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 no, no, no. It's more than
<laughs> you can take your food with you. It's okay. It's okay. Leave the plate there. Assalamu alaikum to everybody. Good evening. I'm trying to spot the Imam of the Masjid, Imam Tariq. Hi, Imam. Assalamu alaikum to all of you. Welcome to Masjid Isa ibn Maryam. This mosque is named after Jesus, Isa ibn Maryam. Jesus, the son of Mary. Uh, we invite you to this, uh, welcome you to this international symposium on Jerusalem, in fact, the future of Jerusalem. We will begin with a short recitati recitation from the Quran by the Imam of the Masjid, Imam Tariq Hagis. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم سبحان الذي أسرى بعبده ليلا من المسجد الحرام إلى المسجد الأقصى الذي باركنا حوله الذي باركنا حوله لنريه من آياتنا وأتينا موسى الكتاب وجعلناه هدى لبني إسرائيل وجعلناه هدى لبني إسرائيل ألا تتخذوا من دوني وكيلا ذريه من حملنا مع نوح انه كان عبدا شكورا thank you very much sure. uh, the imam of the masjid recited the first three ayahs from the 17th chapter of the quran and i will translate them to you but before I translate those verses, I wanted to share one thing with you, and that is, there is a reason why we are holding this event in the mosque and not in the two conference halls that are available to us. The reason why we are holding this into the mosque and bearing the little inconveniences that we have to bear is because we think reflecting upon Jerusalem and talking about Jerusalem is an act of worship. So this is not politics for us. This is worship for us. That's why it's in the main hall, in the main sanctuary of the masjid and not in conference rooms that are attached. The first ayah of this chapter 17 is the key to Muslim relationship with Jerusalem. In this verse, God says, Praise is he who took his servant, transported his servant, that is Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, at night from Masjid al-Haram to Masjid al-Aqsa. So God took, with the help of angels, from Mecca to Jerusalem, Prophet Muhammad, and he took him there, and then God says in this verse, he took him to Masjid al-Aqsa, whose neighborhood he has blessed. So even though, if you read the entire Quran, you will realize that not just the entire earth, but the entire creation is holy. Because everything is created by God, everything is pious and holy. But this verse tells us that there is something very special about Jerusalem. Baratna Haulahu, we have blessed the neighborhood of Masjid al-Aqsa. That is why Jerusalem is holy to Muslims. But there is something also very special. God took Muhammad from Mecca to Jerusalem, where he led a prayer with all the prophets that came before, with Adam, with Abraham, with Moses, with Noah and Jesus at this spot. That's why Muslims refer to Prophet Muhammad as Imam al-Anbiya. He's the Imam of all the prophets because he led the prayer there. So there are two things that happen in this verse. God says, I brought Muhammad to the mosque that is far away, 
because I wanted to show him my signs. Because I wanted to show him my signs and that he and that is where he ascends to the heaven. Now for for Muslims who think about it and for Jews and Christians, you should realize that Prophet Muhammad was sleeping in Mecca when he was brought by angels to heaven, but he had to go through Jerusalem. So when I was reading this verse, I realized that on earth, the gateway to God is Jerusalem. On earth, the gateway to God is Jerusalem. It is a tremendous symbolism that the prophet who was sleeping in the mosque in Mecca was taken to the mosque in Masjid al-Aqsa and taken to heaven. This verse alone guarantees that until the end of time, Jerusalem will be dear, sacred, and precious to Muslims. As long as we reveal the Quran, Jerusalem will be dear to us because it is the gateway to heaven. The second verse that the Imam recited is very interesting too. It says, and we gave Musa the book, which is the Torah, and made it a guidance for the children of Israel, saying, do not take a protector besides me. God has instructed the children of Israel, or the followers of Moses, do not take any other protector, America, Trump, or anyone else. God alone is enough for you as protector. And the third verse that he recites talks about new, the offspring of those, talking about Musa, that he is an offspring of Prophet Noah, and he was a very grateful servant of God. So those are the three verses. And uh, I would now like to invite uh, Dr. Bethany Carl Long, who is the Lieutenant Governor of Delaware. And we have a special connection. She's also a professor at the University of Delaware. She teaches in the health area and also in public policy. So, but I have seen her so often in sacred places that even though she says she's concerned about the health of Delaware, I sometimes suspect that she is not only concerned about the physical health of the people of Delaware, but also their spiritual health. So without much ado, Thank you, Dr. Khan. That's very kind of you, and um, I do worry about the spiritual health. Those who uh, know a little bit about me know I was born here in the lower county of Sussex, raised with a bunch of ministers. So it is nice to be here among many diverse communities and many of you in different faiths and different hats. And for me, I'm going to give you a very a brief greeting. Uh, it is such an honor to be sitting up at a panel of such wonderful, distinguished guests. And I look so forward to hearing from a member of the Israeli parliament, former member, or Dr. Hoffman, who will be offering us the keynote uh, in a couple moments. And for those who don't know, I know some of the women in the room know me quite well. Uh, but for those who haven't heard the story, uh, Dr. Navid Bakar and Dr. Khan and many of you were very well welcoming to me in 2016 and 2015. Brian Gordon, who's here with me, we spent every day on this campus over sharing space uh, separate from the Tobias School as I ran for my different seat, having been in the House and the Senate as I ran for Lieutenant Governor. And so it was every day we got to spend time and prayers and sharing stories and kind of working together. And so it's nice to be here tonight as we celebrate um, and have discussions about this very important conversation on relations uh, in uh, our world and around Jerusalem. And Representative Paul Bombach has joined us in the front seat, and he too and many legislators have recognized the real value of having these conversations. Governor Carney, I know, is very pleased that we're here gathered uh, this evening to begin to have this opportunity in our Delaware community to recognize that we are stronger as a state when we come together and build upon our diversity. Building bridges, not divides, as we have often seen, and as we recognize as we come together in our fabric of a collage, that truly we build upon those issues to make our state and our country greater. I was raised in the Protestant religion, and we often share, I think, in this room, a common denominator of how you treat your neighbor is how you want to be treated with yourself, and to whom much is given, much is expected. And that is an international theme, whether we're gathered here in faith of Islam, Judaism, Christianity. 
it's to recognize our faith and to have that dialogue. And I cannot thank enough the rabbis and others who come together to show leadership here tonight, uh, to recognize, to build those bridges, to make our state truly strong. And to me, there's nothing more important to recognize diversity. My son, believe it or not, spoke Farsi before he spoke English. <laughs> um, I didn't have a clue what he was saying. I don't speak Farsi, but his daycare provider from Afghanistan did. And to me, it's been about building upon strengths and different languages and backgrounds. And so this evening, I'm not going to hold up your panel. I recognize that you're a little behind time. But I want you to know that, again, the governor, the members of our General Assembly in the state of Delaware, we recognize and value the diversity. And we're very honored that Dr. Hoffman has taken his time to be here and that you've uh, built this conversation. And hopefully we'll have some great conversation from the audience this evening uh, with the wonderful panelists that have come and taken time to be with us in our state. So in closing, thank you uh, for organizing this wonderful event and conversation. And please know that the state of Delaware recognizes and builds upon the strengths of diversity and backgrounds in all face. Thank you. Thank you, Lieutenant Governor, for your gracious uh, comments, welcoming us all. Uh, there are a few things that I need to do, administrative and contextual, before we can uh, listen to the, the Chief Guest. So number one is, uh, to, I mean, how did this come about? Uh, the University of Delaware won a grant from the State Department last year. Uh, the State Department uh, at least until now, invests in a lot of public diplomacy. And one of the initiatives of the State Department is to educate people from other countries about our political institutions. I mean, right now, not, not a good idea <laughs> to talk about our political institutions because they're all shut down. But, <laughs> but we seem to be persuaded by this rather strange idea that they are worth spreading worldwide. And one of those institutes is called the National Security Institute, where we tell people or show people how Americans arrive at what is their national security, what are the institutions that are involved in securing our national So that grant is with the University of Delaware. I'm its academic director. There are a lot of my colleagues who are working on that grant here. And as part of that grant, we bring in 18 scholars of national security from 18 different countries. And uh, when I saw that one of the scholars on that was from Israel, and he also happened to be a person who not only is a scholar, but also a practitioner and a, a politician, a former member of the parliament, I thought, and this was, I was looking at this list as I was responding to President Trump's declaration uh, on Jerusalem. And so I thought that at least in Delaware, we will talk about it and create a forum to give an opportunity for all people from all communities in Delaware to express, you may support that initiative, you may not support the initiative, but let's stand up and speak for Jerusalem. So that is the context of this. There's something that I do want to share with you, so give me one second. I have never been to Israel. I don't think I can get through the security, <laughs> but let's see. Uh, but nearly 20 years ago, I did my dissertation at Georgetown University on Jerusalem. And, and this, this book is out of that dissertation. It's called Jihad for Jerusalem. Okay, if you're freaking out, you should buy and read it. Okay. <laughs> it's not something that you freak out. So I want to read two paragraphs from it uh, that I wrote in 1999. This book is as old as my son, who is at college right now. And, and this is important because it tells you not only as to how people will think of, of how central Jerusalem is to, to, the, to humanity, not just to the three faiths, but to humanity. Regardless of the outcome of peace negotiations, I'm writing this in 1999, seems to be applicable any day, every day of our life. 
Regardless of the outcome of peace negotiations and the geopolitical developments in the region, Jerusalem's sacredness will remain. In 3,000 years, it did not lose its centrality to Judaism, and there is no possibility that it will lose its importance to Christianity and Islam. Many secular analysts in the West may believe that religion itself will lose its prominence, thereby making the sacredness of Jerusalem moot. However, the fact remains that besides the rise and fall of communism and the emergence and now decline of liberal democracy, the global resurgence of religion and its political influence is one of the most important developments of the last century. Religion and political power are not ready to disappear either in domestic or world politics. If anything, we will see even greater role of religion I am convinced that as long as religious identities remain strong in the region and elsewhere, the status of Jerusalem will always be contested and the struggle for sovereignty of Jerusalem will not diminish. And then here is hope. As long as Jerusalem is seen as one city desired by three different religions, it will remain contested. It cannot be imagined. It cannot be imagined as three cities desired by three faiths. It's just one city. It cannot be imagined as three cities desired by three faiths. That would be absurd. The only other alternative is to imagine Jerusalem as one city desired by one faith. The only solution that I saw, at least in 1999, was to imagine Jerusalem as one city desired by one faith. Discourses geared toward this particular goal can and should be encouraged. The conflict between Jews and Christians has diminished primarily because of the widespread understanding that the modern West is based on Judeo-Christian ethics. If the already existing discourse that talks about the commonalities between Islam, Christianity and Judaism and depicts them all as the Abrahamic tradition, if we recognize the fact that Judaism, Christianity, and Islam are all one faith tradition, the Abrahamic tradition, then if consensus can be manufactured and fostered, then Jerusalem will truly be one city of one great religious tradition. And I'm still hoping that eventually that is the best solution. I'm going to make a few political statements because of the pressure that President Trump's initiative has done. Just this week, it has been announced that as early as April, the United States Embassy from Tel Aviv will move into the consul, consular office that exists in Western Jerusalem. So probably the date, date is 19th uh, of April that the, the annex and the consular <coughs> office that exists in Jerusalem will become the U.S. Embassy. So we're just about uh, two and a half months away. The president and his office today announced that they will be cutting $46 million in aid, aid that addresses hunger in Palestine. So basically, that particular aid, which was earmarked just to feed the hungry Palestinians, that the White House is going to cut. That's $46 million. Last week, the White House announced that it's going to cut $65 million in aid that goes to UNWRA, United Nations, uh, it's called Relief and Works Association, the agency that essentially provides aid to uh, the Palestinians. So it's not just that we are trying to cut aid to Palestinians, but we are trying to also decimate the institutions which provide sustenance and aid to Palestinians. So far, only Belgium has stepped forward and offered $19 million to fill the gap uh, that the president. But the most interesting and most horrible news also is that while there are no announcements, Mahmoud Abbas has been told from Arab countries, Saudi Arabia and the Gulf, that the aid that was to come to them from Arab countries will also not come. They're not going to make the announcement, but they're not going to transfer funds between civil servants and salaries, etc., etc. None of those is going to happen. 
And the reason for that is the pressure from the Gulf states to essentially force Mahmoud Abbas to accept the peace plan that President Trump is offering. So right now, right now, nearly everybody in the world is forgetting the, the plight of the Palestinians and are not willing to help them. So I want to congratulate you at least today you are here to stand up and speak for that. The second thing that I would like to say is this, that I personally do not subscribe to nationalisms. There are two narratives about the problem. One is the problem of the condition of the Palestinian people and their aspirations for self-determination. The other thing is the sacredness of Jerusalem itself. So while many Muslims may disagree with me about that, for them both are just one issue, but to me it is sacred. So I have three points that I want to share with you that I pray for. Number one, that Palestinians get a state of their own or live a life of dignity and full of rights and security and the same for everyone else in the region, including Israelis. So everybody lives there. The fact that Jerusalem is sacred to us does not mean that we have to exclude those to whom it is also sacred. The second thing is, no holy places should be destroyed by anyone, especially in the Haram al-Sharif area. Number three, this may be controversial to everybody, people of all faith who hold Jerusalem sacred should have access to it. If that entails building a new faith complex there that houses the Temple of Solomon and Masjid al-Aqsa and the rest of the Haram at the same time, then so be it. One of the things that puzzles me is that the Temple of Solomon is just as sacred to Muslims as it is to Jews. So it is a question I want to pose to Muslims as to why aren't we eager to build the Masjid of Suleiman al-Islam. So that is my third point, that we build a complex there which accommodates. The alternatives of exclusive struggle between religious communities can be destabilizing to the entire region. I can tell you this much, as long as the issue of Jerusalem festers there will be no peace in the region. And as long as one side or the other feels that it has been unfairly and unjustifiably abused by the international system or the powers, that discontentment will fuel violence, unhappiness, lack of peace and instability. So I pray that these three things at least come out. We have distributed to you some maps I don't know whether all of you got hold of it. And if you look at this particular map, you will realize that the idea or the hope for the two-state solution seems to be disappearing pretty rapidly. We have a very small window of time. Some people actually believe that it is not possible to have two states there anymore without massive uh, dislocation and redistribution of population. If we delay this issue, and you can see from the maps, I wish I had a map for 1994 when the Oslo peace process was done, and also for, the, for when the last negotiations took place, but we don't. So we have to realize that maybe the two sides are caught up in a cycle of suspicion and insecurity, and maybe hatred also, that they cannot escape the cycle. So it's important for people of goodwill from all over the world to intervene and try to do. On the back side, we have, these are two maps. This is the whole map of the city of Jerusalem. And the little box there you see is the, the East Jerusalem, actually the, the sacred areas. And then I have an enlarged map there of the sacred areas. And in this box, there is the box where you can see the contested areas. I don't like using the word, I would rather use the word shared sacredness. So with that, I'm now going to invite to speak, uh, let me find your bio, Dr. Ronan Hoffman. Dr. Ronan Hoffman is a, a distinguished scholar of 
diplomacy and peacemaking in Israel. He got his PhD from King's College in the UK, but he has also worked in public service. He was one of the advisors of Prime Minister Itzhak Rabin. He also worked with Prime Minister Ehud Barak. He was also a very prominent and leader in negotiations for Israel, especially against Syria. I'm not exposing any classified stuff, I hope. <laughs> so he was the lead negotiator for Israel uh, with Syria, which lasted for several years. Uh, Dr. Ron Hoffman also served in the parliament uh, for several years. Uh, and uh, to our masjid, sir. Good evening, thank you very much for the warm opening remarks and um, thank you for having me. This is, uh, you know, I don't take it for granted. I think um, I was asked to speak about the issue of Jerusalem and to, ish to also to speak about uh, a broader picture maybe about the peace process, the chances for getting peace in our region. And, you know, these issues are sensitive. These, these issues are uh, heavy in a way. And um, I think this is a great opportunity that to create, create a dialogue. And in many ways, I think we can learn from you guys back there in the Middle East how to conduct an open dialogue and welcome each other. Even if we disagree with each other, this is a, a great, great way to share ideas, to exchange ideas, uh, and to speak to each other. Because after all, I don't believe that we can get agreements without speaking to each other. There's no guarantee that we will get agreements. But if we don't speak to each other, we don't conduct an open dialogue, there is a guarantee that we will not uh, achieve any agreement. So I really, really appreciate the opportunity that you gave me by hosting me and my friends, my colleagues from the group, from, from the program. Thank you very much again. Um, I would like to refer, before I start my the, the things according to the points I've, I've prepared, uh, to uh, Dr. Khan's um, um, remark or int introduction that he did. I was not leading the uh, uh, negotiations with Syria, so don't blame me for uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I was a member and I was a coordinator of the Israeli delegation, <laughs> but um, I, I did not have uh, the chance to lead the negotiations. Maybe in the future, I don't know if with Syria, but maybe with the Palestinians, we'll see. Um, I, I um, would like to start by um, say that uh, for many years, for many years, I've been combined academic uh, work and political work. I was in the academia, I was in, in politics. Uh, I moved from academia to politics uh, and back. And um, I, I want to say that the beauty of the academia is that you can speak about anything you want to speak. You can dream, you are actually requested to be creative. Um, you can use your imagination, and you should use your imagination, and you can create patterns of thinking, shape of thinking, all kind of wonderful things. Sometimes, being in the academia is getting you disconnected from reality, unfortunately. Um, the beauty of politics is that uh, when you're in politics, you don't have the privilege to be vague or to stay up at, you know, on the air. You have to make decisions and you have to be part of, of, of processes of this, this, this decision making. Why I must, uh, to my opinion, it's, it is a beauty because it's not easy. It's much easier to just, you know, it, the beauty of it is because in politics you have to be able to compromise. You have to be able to, to listen to the other side. And you have to be able to argue uh, and to, by respecting the other side, also to make decisions upon what you really believe. And, and you, you cannot actually escape from, at the end of the day, making the decisions that you need to make. And so um, I think that, that uh, when we... Um, come to the issue of Jerusalem, this is also what we are facing. A two, I would say, two levels of discussions. One discussion could be uh, the discussion of symbols, the discussions of ethos, the discussions of narrative, the discussions of beliefs. 
uh, the discussion of differences in, uh, in, in, in religions. It's beautiful. But I don't know that if we stay only at that level of discussion, we would be able to reach agreements. The other option is to respect that level of symbols and narratives and ethos, but to engage in a political, not in a narrow political, but in a practical political discussions and try to understand each other and try to make decisions. What I'd like to do um, tonight, in the less than 20 minutes that I have, is to talk about the pragmatic side, the way I see it, the way I was asked to uh, give you the, the, the Israeli take of, of uh, President Trump's statement and, and of the, the chances for peace in, in the region. Uh, so I'd like to do it, I'm not going to speak about religion, I'm not going to speak about narratives, I'm going to speak and to try to analyze what is really happening? And what are the chances? What, what have been the failures in previous negotiations? What are the chances to succeed in future negotiations? And maybe even to suggest some tips to our leaders in the region um, in order to be able to resume negotiations and, and, um, and, and move uh, forward. A um, few words about my political affiliation in order to put uh, the following remarks in context. I belong to a political party uh, which is called Yeshatid. It's in the center of the Israeli polit political map, not right wing, not left wing. We support, I'm not, I'm, uh, by the way, I'm here speaking for myself. I'm not uh, uh, representing my government, not my political party, not, I mean, I'm, I'm sharing with you my own views. I support two state solution. For many, many years, I've been supporting two state solution. Not just because it's a just thing to create and to do, but also as an Israeli patriot, I believe that the only way that Israel could protect the two fundamental values that it's, um, it has been established upon, a Jewish state and a democratic state, is by having a two-state solution. Otherwise, at some point, the two values will contradict each other, and Israel will not be able to protect these two fundamental values as, as uh, a bread and butter of, of our, of, of our uh, entity, of our uh, experience. And therefore, I, I would like to put things in context. I support two-state solution, I've been involved in negotiations, and from here I would like to start uh, telling you a little bit about the perspective on Jerusalem and, and on other issues. Um, I think I should start from the bottom line. The bottom line, when I look at, at my people, my, the Israelis, the majority of the Israelis also support two-state solution. According to polls and surveys, there are at least 60% of the Israeli public that really support two-state solution. Unfortunately, the majority of the Israelis, including those who support the state solution, do not believe that this is achievable. So, the first obstacle and challenge that we have is the lack of trust, of mutual trust. And as long as we will not be able to create another atmosphere, to create mutual trust, to believe that we have an honest and sincere partner on the other side, and to create the same feeling among the other side, regarding us, I don't think we can actually move forward. Um, about Jerusalem, I have to say that most of the Israelis, including the Israelis who support two-state solution, including myself, do not really think that it's a question whether Jerusalem is or should be the capital of the state of Israel. Jerusalem has been, is, and will be the capital of the state of Israel. And, you know, to, to, to listen or to look at President Trump making his statement, many Israelis felt that this is a very great gesture and very friendly kind of thing to do. To be honest, we didn't wait for President Trump. Right after the establishment of the State of Israel, uh, David Ben-Gurion and the, the, the leadership of the new state uh, made Jerusalem as the capital of, of, of the state of Israel. And ever since, the 
if Jerusalem is not a question. Jerusalem is the capital of the state of Israel. This is the real politics. I, I can't think of any political leader in Israel, a pragmatic political leader, from the scale of the of political map, from left to right, that would agree to put this on, on, on the table of negotiations, that question whether Israel should be or should not be the capital of the state of Israel. It will never happen, and we need to acknowledge it. And in that respect, we didn't need to wait for President Trump. And to be honest with you, and I'm sharing with you, I think the most of the world did not wait for President Trump. When I was a, a member of the Israeli parliament, the Knesset is in Jerusalem. I hosted so many delegations from all over the world, including Palestinian colleagues who came to discuss and to, 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 uh, uh, to talk to us. They all came to the Knesset. They all came to Jerusalem. So, in fact, it's not just us. It's the, 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 almost in the entire world, in fact, is recognizing that the, state of, the, the capital of the state of Israel is Jerusalem. By saying that, I'm not saying that the future of the peace process or the future of, of the, our relations with the Palestinians should not, in, in that future, we should not be able to speak about anything that has to do with East Jerusalem, neighborhoods, status of East Jerusalem. But the basic question whether Israel is, or Jerusalem is the capital of Israel, is not on the table. And it will not be on the table. That we, we need to acknowledge that. Um, I'll tell you more than that. I think that the only way to move forward to agree upon other fundamental issues in the peace process, and there are other core issues that we need to agree upon, the only way to do it is to acknowledge what I just said. Why should we stuck on the impossible? Why should, why should we get stuck on that? There are other heavy issues, territories, borders, security, um, relations, you know, normalizations. So, so many heavy issues that we have to, to negotiate and to agree upon. So instead of getting stuck on the impossible, I would su suggest to be pragmatic, to be realistic, and to move forward to agree upon the things that we really can, can negotiate uh, on and, and, and can agree upon. Um, actually, when I think about the entire time of the negotiations between us and the Palestinians. The, the direct negotiation started back in 1993, when uh, the PLO and, and the Israeli government signed a mutual uh, recognition agreement under Chairman Arafat and Prime Minister Rabin. And then the negotiation of the Oslo Accord started. And then there were many, many, several, or many, many rounds of negotiations um, along the years. Unfortunately, as we all know, most of them failed and there is no peace between the Israelis and the Palestinians. I would like, in a few minutes, to analyze the way I see the reasons for the failures. There are many reason why, reasons why, why the negotiations until now uh, actually failed. I would say that the first one is uh, well, we spoke about the trust. So the second one is uh, the way that the two sides came to negotiations with preparing it, with uh, uh, matching the expectations, and mainly the way that two, two sides did not agree on the agenda of the negotiations before the negotiations started. This is one of the most challenging thing in negotiations. The issue of Jerusalem, or other core issues. Should we start by negotiating over these core issues and then move to easier issues? Or should we leave it to the end and start with easier issues and then build a trust and a corridor towards the real discussion over the core issues? That has been a dilemma. And we couldn't find the right mechanism where to start, how to continue, and where to end. The sequence of the negotiations have always been an um, obstacle in a way. The other obstacle and the other failure has been uh, 
the um, I would say maybe even the, the the most important or the main failure has been the fact that since the beginning of the negotiations, the United States of America and other countries and Israel and the Palestinians, but I'm mentioning first the United States of America because the American administrations <laughs> along the years have been the, co the sponsor and the host of the negotiations. Um, the, we, all the sides were involved have seen the negotiations as if there is a bilateral track only, or almost only bilateral track. Meaning, everybody saw the, the Palestinian-Israeli conflict as the core of the entire conflict. And so everybody expected that when you get into a negotiation room, there will be the Israelis, the Palestinians, and no one else. But let's think about it. When we at some point, we would like to, to, to speak about heavy issues. And Jerusalem, by the way, the East Jerusalem, the status of neighborhoods in East Jerusalem, and the status in the Holy Basin of Jerusalem, of course, to keep it open and to welcome all religions to pray and worship there, that has, be, has been on the negotiations only twice since 1993, without fundamental agreements, but with hypothetical kind of understandings for the future. When we speak about such heavy issues. We have to remember that the conflict is not a bilateral conflict only. It's a regional thing. How can we speak about Jerusalem without Jordan being in the room? How can we speak about, about Gaza without Egypt being in the room? How can we speak about uh, mutual security arrangements without having other uh, Arab sides in the room? I mean, the conflict is not just between two sides. And if the conflict is not just between two sides, then the resolution of the conflict could not be just, cannot be just between two sides. And when I think about it, you know, I'm quite puzzled how no one of the leaders in, in the past, since 1993, have seen it. Well, the Saudis, at some point in March, 27th of March, 2002, submitted to the Arab League a proposal, a peace plan, called Saudi Peace Plan, and then the Arab League adopted it, and, and, and since then it's called the, Arab, the Saudi Arab Peace uh, Initiative. And this is the, the first, the first uh, I would say, plan or initiative that looks at the conflict from a regional approach. This is the only way, I think, we should look at the conflict in order to be able to start or to get a chance to resolve it. It's a regional thing. And as long as we, or everybody else, is pushing us to get into the room with the Palestinians, only two sides, without involving the Waqf, without involving uh, 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 the other, uh, other neighbors who also feel that they have stakes in the conflict, I don't think it's possible. Um, I'd like to move from the failures to the future and, and say what how we, uh, do I think we can, uh, or we should, resolve the conflict? What we need is on both sides, at least on both sides, of course, again, there are several sides, but at least on the Israeli and the Palestinian side, courageous political leaders who decide that it's about time to get in the room, invite other players, and negotiate for peace. It will not come from pressure from outside. If it will come from pressure for, from outside, it will be just a just to play the game. But it's not sincere, it's not real. It has to come from ourselves. But here is a challenge. In Israel at least, which is a democracy, a prime minister who makes tough decisions needs to get hit the political support. By the way, I believe that it's also true in the, in the uh, Palestinian side. We need to get political support. How do we get political support without preparing the public, be, without building mutual public diplomacy, without showing some hope? It's very, very hard. And we have the tendency to think that political leaders are strong enough and it's on their shoulders, and what they need to do is to get behind closed doors, negotiate, sign an agreement, then come to the public, show it, and, 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 sign, and sign a contract. 
it, it doesn't work this way. Processes like this cannot just come top-down. There has to be a bottom-up process to meet the top-down process, meaning political leaders have to involve the communities in the process, not just in a result of the process. And this is something that we cannot do just by having our own side doing it. We need to show our people, and the other side needs to show his people, that we are serious about what we are doing. If I need to, to, to convince, or we need to convince the Israeli public that there is a chance for peace, we need some leaders and people from the Arab side to do exactly what we are doing here now. To speak to each other, to welcome each other, to, to, to welcome even things that we disagree with. And unfortunately, we are not, we're not doing it enough. And I don't believe, I, I know that some of my colleagues in Israel believe that this is not necessary. They believe that if leaders uh, would agree upon something, then the public would support it. Maybe. But even if the, the dealers would get to a political kind of contract, it will become a, the way I see it, artificial kind of peace. It's not reconciliation. Reconciliation is a deep process that communities need to go through and the, the leaders have to lead their communities to reconciliate. It can take generations. It can take, can take for generations. You cannot do it by being in Camp David under one administration or another for two weeks and then come to the public and say, that's it, we con reconciliated and there is peace. They've tried. That's exactly what happened in Oslo. It's not enough. So that's the first thing we need to do. We need to elect leaders who will be brave and courageous enough to get to the people and prepare the people and involve the people in that process. The other thing we need to do, both sides, is to introduce to the process more, I would say, authentic uh, elements from our cultures. The fact that we fly all the way, we, the neighbors from the Middle East, we need to fly all the way to Washington to speak to each other. <laughs> and we speak to each other through legal advisors and diplomats. And, um, and, and we don't uh, have in the process uh, even the element of sulha, of, of, of forgiveness, or, or, or being able to, to, to uh, introduce any he healing element to the process, is not enough. It is not enough. Thank God, you know, that we have in our religions and in our cultures enough elements of <coughs> being able to reconciliate, not just to fight. And we need to introduce these elements also to the process. And finally, I think, I'm optimistic, I think that there is a chance to reach peace. And what we need to do is to move from the table any preconditions. And again, this is very, very hard. Each side has a bag with preconditions that we, we uh, uh, put in front of each other. I don't think we should have preconditions, because once you come to the negotiating table with preconditions, uh, you put you know, in front of yourself obstacles, and sometimes it's just impossible to, to, to overcome these obstacles and challenges. How can we negotiate without preconditions? Again, here maybe we need some help from third parties, we need some guarantees, when we talk about security, I don't have the time to get into the, the you know, all the issues. But, um, but I think that, that um, the main assumption would be when we resume negotiations, in, inshallah, yeah, that a shame. He, we will do it uh, without preconditions, with more trust between each other, and uh, with an optimistic uh, view that everything is possible because after all we are people and we want to live in peace with each other. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Hoffman. Uh, Middle East is such an incredible place. 
it surprises you all the time. I never thought I would hear an Israeli criticize America and praise Saudi Arabia. <laughs> Especially on peace process and peace plan. But that's an interesting observation. First, the good news, we have caught up on time. So, thank you very much to Bethany, to the Lieutenant Governor, and to myself, and to, to Dr. Hoffman. Uh, we have a, a star-studded panel to follow. Uh, each of them will be responding for five minutes. Uh, before I call the first speaker, I just want to tell you the order of the speakers so the speakers also get prepared. Uh, the first speaker will be Dr. Gregory Jones, followed by Rabbi Douglas Kranz, followed by Imam Ahmad Shibley, who drove all the way from New Jersey to be part of us, followed by Jacob Bender, Philip Duarte, Ikram Masmudi, and John Elzefon. I also want to recognize the senator of this area, Brian Townsend, who's joined us. Thank you very much for joining us. He is a very good friend and a good representative for the community in this area. I also want to acknowledge, uh, yes, yes, yes. Oh, yes, Paul Bombach, who is also a uh, your representative of this area too. Yes, neighboring area, uh, a little north. Uh, uh, I also want to recognize four partners, Council on American Islamic Relations, who is co-sponsoring this event with us uh, from Philadelphia, the Del Nata Group, who have for whom the Palestinian cause is so close to the heart, the Palestinian Children's Relief Fund. Please collect some of the material at that, and the Delaware State Police, good friends who are here. Uh, so now, without much ado, I would like to invite Dr. Gregory Jones, who just a few months ago completed 40 years of service to his community. I consider him the, the spiritual big brother of the state of Delaware, and uh, he has hosted me several times and spoken at uh, various mosques and synagogues uh, on, on many issues, and he is also one to whom the Palestinian issue, the Middle East peace process, is very close to his heart. So, Dr. Gregory Jones, the pastor of Westminster Presbyterian Church of Wilmington. That is a very kind way of saying, I am very old. <laughs> Simply put, Jerusalem is sacred to all three Abrahamic faiths. Or I like the way Dr. Kahn introduced the idea of the one faith tradition. All of us believe in the same creator. All of us share most of the same prophets. Jerusalem holds a very special place in the hearts of Jews, Christians, and Muslims. Now, as a follower of Jesus, I see Jerusalem as the most sacred spot on earth for Christians. It's the city that Jesus entered in the final week of his life, and it's where he delivered most of his key teachings. The Church of the Holy Sepulchre, or the Church of the Resurrection, is located in the old city of Jerusalem. The church is built over the place where Jesus was crucified by the Romans and where he was entombed. Thus, that is the holiest site for all Christians. Roman Catholics, Protestants, Orthodox, Evangelicals, Fundamentalists, Traditionalists, Progressives, uh, we all recognize Jerusalem as ground zero for our faith. More than one million Christians visit the Church of the Resurrection every year. My wife and I, Camilla's here, we've visited it three times so far. We're taking another group from Westminster there this June. It's a very holy spot. It's a sacred spot. Jews, Muslims, and Christians all recognize Jerusalem as a unique place for their religions. And I don't think that claim can be made about any other spot on earth. Theophilus III is the Orthodox Patriarch of Jerusalem, and he's widely considered the most senior Christian figure in Jerusalem. He and a dozen other Christian leaders there in 
the Holy Land, uh, presented Dr. Trump, or President Trump with a warning recently on the U.S. Embassy moving to Jerusalem. They said it would likely increase hatred, conflict, violence, and suffering. Not only in Jerusalem, but in the greater Holy Land. And most importantly, it seems to me, it will move us away from any attempts at unity toward a destructive division. Now, Christians have been in the Holy Land for 2,000 years. We have survived hostile governments and a number of invasions throughout the centuries. <laughs> Our survival has, I think, depended on one basic principle. And that is that all these holy sites are shared by everyone. And that everyone has access to them. Different groups of Christians have argued over who should have the authority in the Church of the Resurrection. One group wants to kind of tell the other group where they should be. You know how they solve the problem? You know who holds the key to the Church of the Resurrection? The Muslims. Now, a Muslim family has held that key for centuries to keep the Christians from fighting amongst themselves. The different faiths need to work together in order to keep access open to all. Now, currently, there are some radical settler groups who are trying to gain control of some of the Christian properties that are in the old city near the Jaffa Gate. If they're allowed to do that, then I think this will increase their ability to remove non-Jews from the old city. And that would be a terrible mistake. The holy sites of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam are well known. No one should have any authority to prevent members of a faith from visiting their holy sites. Jerusalem cannot be in the exclusive possession of one faith over and against the others. If one faith seizes control, there's never going to be peace. Jerusalem is and must continue to be a city that is shared by, as Dr. Khan said, one faith tradition. Now, as a follower of Jesus, whom Christians know as the Prince of Peace, we are also called to be peacemakers. And I believe that we're always to work for solutions. And so we have to not only stay up here in the um, abstract world, but also get involved politically. And our task is to work for the common good. That entails overcoming injustices, working for peace, and seeing that all parties are heard. I believe that the announcement made by President Trump and trumpeted by Vice President Pence, who is a Christian Zionist, to move the embassy there, I feel like that is handing ISIS another propaganda tool. Um, just like the Muslim ban on immigrants entering the U.S., our government just handed ISIS a gift there. They can easily point to the ban on immigrants entering this country and simply say, the West has always been against the Muslims. Don't you see that? So why don't you stand up for yourself and join our cause and fight those people? Moving the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem means the U.S. is taking sides in this conflict and we're no longer a, a peace broker. And I think from what you said, that that may be a good thing, that the U.S. is not a peace broker. It certainly needs to involve many different countries in that region. And I especially like the idea of getting people involved locally to talk about how we can live together, to talk about the issues of forgiveness and reconciliation, they did it in South Africa. There's no reason it can't be done. I believe most will see this idea of going to move our embassy there as a slap in the face to the Christian and Muslim Palestinians. I think it's going to lead to more instability and make peace more elusive. But I think 
good people of faith can have discussions, can work toward the common good, and can make peace possible in a place we didn't think it really could be possible. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Greg. <clears throat> Our next speaker is Rabbi Douglas Kranz. I don't know, maybe the low taxes, I don't know what it is, how Delaware got so lucky that <laughs> Rabbi Kranz decided to retire in Delaware. Uh, he has also served his own congregation for several years, but he is one of the co-founders of J Street. Uh, I don't know how many of you know that one of the things that people talk a lot about is that the reason why America is so much in favor of Israel and not is because of the influence of the famous Israeli lobby, APAC. But now there is another Israeli lobby, not just as powerful, not as rich, uh, but the one that advocates the two-state solution. And that is the J Street and Rabbi Douglas Kranz is one of the founders of J Street. And we would like to hear from him now. Thank you. First of all, it's a privilege to be here with all of you in this sacred space and to have the opportunity to talk about what it means for people to come together, people who don't agree on everything, who don't share a common religion necessarily, but who believe in discussions and who believe in hearing the voices of others. And so I come in that spirit with a sense of gratitude to all of you. I want to say a word to our speaker, the member of the Knesset Hoffman. I have been inordinately privileged to know a number of members of the Knesset going back to 1974 when I met Mayor Pail years and years ago and in my role as uh, chairman and president of Merits USA, when the Rabin government was elected, we were all in the government together. And it's from those experiences and those people that many of my ideas about how we move forward have been formed. And the word compromise that you use is true in, in every venue of life, marriages, and peacemaking as well. Uh, the most complicated is marriage, I suspect, for most all of us. I, I, want to, I want to share with you a, a perspective about why I think it's important to pay attention to what you heard tonight. What you heard tonight was somebody who advocates compromise and discussion. And, and the roadmap that was outlined is, in my opinion, exactly what Israel needs and what Palestinians need. And I am grateful to have heard such a, an incredible presentation. I want to share with you something um, that I read from the Israeli newspaper Haaretz uh, this morning. And, and it caught my eye because it was written by um, Mosi Raz, who is a member of the Merits Party with whom I've been associated for so many years now. And, and he publishes an account on his Twitter feed and that, that really discusses what it's like to live under occupation. And I want to talk about both sides of this equation for just a moment. During though, oh, sorry, day to day life under occupation, during two quiet weeks, quiet weeks, he writes, Israel extended the detention of a 16 year old girl who slapped a soldier and that of her mother who filmed her doing it. Another 13 year old girl was sent to prison for three months for throwing stones. The detention of a woman member of the Palestinian parliament was extended without trial by another six months. 16 Palestinian cars were vandalized by settlers. Two million people continue to live in a prison of Gaza, in the prison of Gaza. And thousands of Palestinians in the West Bank were subject, subjected to continuous nighttime raids of their villages and homes. As he writes, business as usual. This is a member of the Israeli Knesset who writes these. And I want to suggest that the behavior of Israel is not alone destructive of Palestinians. 
but the behavior of Israel, Israelis toward the Palestinians is from my perspective self-destructive and that it is going to destroy the character of Israel, the character represented by an extraordinary member of the Knesset here who shared with us his ideas. So I, I think that it's, it's very important for us to remember that the occupier is just as as um, as self is just as hurt by the occupation as the occupied are. It's a bad equation, and we have to end that equation. I also want to suggest that, and here I want to talk a little bit about J Street just for a moment. One of the realities of the occupation and the behavior I described is that it has blurred the boundary lines that delineate a two-state solution. And we all know that boundaries are significant. And once you start to erase one boundary, like a neighborhood line, all right, then other boundaries fall as well. That's why this behavior is so, so distressing to me in particular, because it's destroying the otherwise noble character of, of Israel and the Zionist dream, of which I am completely supportive. Um, I, I want to say a word about where I think we are. I remember it during the 1990s, throughout the Oslo process, when Meretz was in the government, um, before Rabin was assassinated. Remember all of those years, I thought we were close in 2000. And I thought we were at a sprint to the end. The truth is that we're not in a sprint. This has turned out to be a marathon. And it's going to require of each and every one of us a commitment to stay in the race and to keep running and to keep working to bring the parties together in every way that we possibly can. That, to me, is, is our mission. And, and not only do we need Jews, we need everybody in this room to work with us to create an environment that's supportive of the words we heard spoken tonight. I thank you all. Thank you, Rabbi Kranz. Before I invite Imam Shibli, I have a couple of things to share. Uh, about a year and a half ago, uh, the Delaware Council and, and this religious complex, the school and the masjid, hosted a conference on social justice uh, uh, against anti-Semitism, against Islamophobia, against racism, against gender bias, etc. But uh, naively, I scheduled an interfaith panel on Saturday, which some people might have construed as anti-Semitic, but no, <laughs> it was on Saturday and it's Sabbath and I didn't realize. But but Rabbi Kranz broke his Sabbath to speak on that panel. Mustafa was also on that panel. And he said something incredible. He said to me, the only circumstances under which we can break Sabbath if, is if it is a matter of life and death. And so he said for him, standing up against Islamophobia was a matter of life and death. And therefore he broke his Sabbath to stand with Muslims against Islamophobia at that time. In this secular world, I love working with religious people because they touch your soul. After Friday prayer, Naveed, Dr. Naveed Bakar, the president of the masjid, and I were sitting in that corner over there, and we got a phone call from Imam Shibli who said he saw a flyer and he didn't notice the word Imam on the flyer. So we were getting prepared for a scolding from him. <laughs> so we preempted it by saying, come down and join the panel. And he's driven two hours from New Jersey to speak. But he said something incredible. He said, the cause of Masjid al-Aqsa, the word Masjid al-Aqsa means the farthest mosque. The reason why 
some Muslim scholars think it's called the furthest mosque is because that is the furthest that Prophet Muhammad sallallahu prayed. He has traveled further up to, the, uh, up to Damascus for trade purposes. But that is the furthest he may have prayed from Mecca. That's why it's called Masjid al-Aqsa. But well, the Imam said something incredible. He said that we who live here may not have the opportunity to go so far to do something for Masjid al-Aqsa, but we can at least drive to Masjid Isa and pray for Masjid al-Aqsa. <laughs> So I present to you Imam Shibli, he is from New Jersey, he is a, a stalwart in interfaith relations, just Google him, he, he is a blessing not just for the New Jersey, but Delaware and all of us. Thank you for coming.
to hear the word insha'Allah and the majority of us we don't know the, the meaning of that. Did you hear the word insha'Allah? Yes. Did you hear the word insha'Allah? Yes. You know if I say word insha'Allah with the will of God and I don't put all my power, if I have the power, if I don't put all my power to let the word insha'Allah exist, not by theory, but by action, God will judge me when I am in my grave, either I was, you know, buried in Jerusalem, or in Mecca, or in al Medina, or in Washington DC, or anywhere in the world, because I didn't say the truth. And my five minutes is finished with one <laughs> suggestion, seriously. My five minutes finished with what's one suggestion. My suggestion is, the Quran said in chapter, the last couple chapter in the Quran said, Oh you who believe, why you say something and you do something else? Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu, lima taquluna ma la taf'aloon. Our, our uh, priest, uh, uh, father, uh, uh, 40 years plus serving the Bible, yes or no? Our rabbi said, good word, yes or no? Yes. Okay, the imam is here to tell you. God will, 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 will question all of us, the three of us, because we said every one of us present to our religion. No, my dear respect guest. No, my dear brother in humanity. None of us present one religion only. We speak about Moses. We speak about Jesus. We speak about Muhammad. All of them are the messenger of God. Is our issue since 1948, the year I was born? <laughs> I give you my date of birth, you can Google it. <laughs> I have only one wife, you know that. Six kids American, we thank God, alhamdulillah, not inshallah too, alhamdulillah. You know, praise be to Allah, with the will of God. But the point is, we don't say, we are belong to one religion, one prophet. We have to believe in all of them. Let me pray to Allah, the creator of David, and the creator of Muhtar, I'm talking about those people, you know, and the creator of all of us to bring peace, not only in Jerusalem, Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa, or in Palestine, or in Arab world, but to bring peace all over the world if we are honest. Thank you. God bless you. In Arabic, wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. You're the first speaker that I didn't have to show the time clip. Uh, I have been kissed in the past, but this is the first time someone kissed my book. <laughs> and for a professor and writer of books, that makes me very happy. Jazakallah khairan imam. Our next speaker is Jacob Bender. Jacob Bender really is fascinating. I love his name. He bends a lot of our preconceived notions. I want to take one minute and talk about a rabbi of Medina. I don't know how many of you know that after the second major battle in the life of Prophet Muhammad <laughs> uh, the Battle of Ahad, one man came to Prophet Muhammad and said, do you know my father, so the Prophet said, who was he? He said, my father was the rabbi of Medina. His name was Rabbi Mukhairih. The Prophet said, yes, I know of him. In fact, I wrote an article with what the Prophet next said. He said, he was the best of them. That's how he referred to Rabbi Mukhairih. He said, did you know that yesterday Rabbi Mukhairih, my father, died fighting with you? He was the first Jewish martyr of Islam died fighting with Prophet Muhammad So the Prophet said, yes, I just found out. And then his son says, do you know that my, I heard the rabbis are very rich. <laughs> Did you know that he was also the richest man in the city of Medina? And the Prophet said, I didn't know that. He said, well, he left all his wealth to you. And the Prophet took that wealth and established the first Muslim charitable foundation with Jewish money. 
the first waqf established in Medina was from the money that was given by Raiba Mukhairiq. If you Google my name and Mukhairiq, you can read the whole history. The reason why I'm talking about this Raiba is because I'm now going to present to you the first American Muslim activist who's a Jew. <laughs> Jacob Bender, who is the executive director of Council on American Islamic Relations uh, in Philadelphia, day and night he worries about only one thing and that is the civil rights of American Muslims. Jacob. In October of 1973, the Egyptian and Syrian armies launched a surprise attack upon Israel in an attempt to regain the territories that the Arabs had lost to Israel six years earlier. As a young and naive American Jew, having already spent three summers living in Israel, the shock of Israel's early setbacks, its loss of the Suez Canal and part of the Golan Heights, affected me greatly. I loved the country, its landscape, its cuisine, its people, its feeling of belonging, for as, as Israelis never tired in telling me, we are all Jews here. I was a ready recipient of the official Zionist narrative that the early Zionist settlers returned to the Jewish homeland and found it unpopulated, that the Jews made the desert bloom, that we were intent, that the Arabs were intent on pushing all the Jews into the sea, that the only place in the modern world where a Jew could live a Jewish life was in the Jewish state, that Israel would make all Jews safer, and that in 1948 hundreds of thousands of Arabs had voluntarily left their homes in Palestine at the behest of the invading Arab armies. It would take only a few short years for me to realize that every one of these statements was in fact false. A deliberate, bright, shining lie. A deliberate attempt to hide history's horror. That the so-called Israeli War of Independence had been accompanied by a massive campaign of ethnic cleansing resulting in over 700,000 Palestinian refugees and over 500 destroyed Arab villages. If we wish to solve this conflict, we must do it in a holistic way and not isolate issues. The difference between, as Dr. Hoffman says, Jews and Muslims can sit here and talk. Why can't we talk in the Middle East? The answer is because one side is the occupier of the other side. Yeah. Dr. Hawkins says that he supports the two-state solution. I ask, in Iceland, where is the two-state solution going to be? Dr. Hoffman was part of an Israeli political party in the Netanyahu government that pushed over and over again settlements down the throat of the Palestinian people, deliberately destroying farmland and villages and so-called illegal, illegal building. Dr. Hoffman says that he supports a two-state solution. And yet the settlement project has in fact made that option unviable today. There is no two-state solution left to be had. You also say that you want to come to the negotiations without preconditions. And yet you say that Jerusalem is off the table. <laughs> that is a precondition. One cannot have both and still claim that you have no preconditions. You extol the virtue of the Saudi peace plan. And yet, where was Israel's, Israel's response to the Soviet, to the Saudi peace plan? There was no response of the, to, the, to the Saudi peace plan, which would have meant recognition of the state of Israel by every Arab country and every Muslim country in the world 
And yet Israel never responded to that plan, which was offered twice, in fact. So I asked again, where is the two-state solution going to be? Finally, there were a number of brave Israelis all along who recognized the impossibility of creating a state that mandated a superiority of one group over the other. Over and over again, Palestinians were forbidden to politically organize in Israel. They were forbidden from buying land of Karen Kayemet, of the Jewish National Fund. Many, many Israelis saw that as a basic contradiction in the creation of the State of Israel. One of the greatest was Martin Buber, who immediately after 48 and 49 said that the right of return has to be given to the Palestinians who were expelled because without the Palestinians being a part of the State of Israel, that hatred would fester and would make a solution impossible. I'm proud of the work of those Israelis. I'm proud to know dozens and dozens of Israeli young people who face prison and face jail because they refuse to participate in an army of occupation. One cannot talk about a two-state solution and yet not mention the word occupation. Three days after the Six-Day War ended, another great Israeli, a former teacher of mine, Professor Yeshaho Leibovich, a holder of many, many doctorates in the Hebrew University, and an Orthodox Jew said, okay, we won the war, now it's time to leave the territories. Because if we stay in the territories, Israel will turn out to be an apartheid state. And stay they did. And to talk about Israel now as the only democracy in the Middle East, when anyone who drives through the West Bank sees visibly the nature of an apartheid society. I'm not sure what comes next. But I do know that the present course has not led us to the promised land. why he works for care now you know. <laughs> uh, it's interesting that apparently Rabbi Kranz and uh, Jacob have the same teacher. So our next speaker is Professor Felipe Duarte, all the way from Portugal. He is a professor at the Autonomous University in Portugal. Uh, he has various uh, areas of expertise. I'm going to name only three. He looks at uh, how the internet is being weaponized uh, and securitized. He's also interested in the politics of the Middle East and so also interested in what we in the field call CVE, uh, countering violent extremism. But he's also interested in Sufi music. That's the real reason why he's here. <laughs> so without much ado, Felipe. Okay, thank you. be very brief in my opinions uh, on this, not so much on Jerusalem, but most on Middle East. So I will start saying uh, uh, that I won't provide you 
any kind of uh, idea for the peace in Jerusalem, not even in the Middle East. So I don't have these pretensions. Uh, but I also believe uh, in, this, in a two-state solution, if you just follow uh, certain principles. But I think the most important one is try to understand, just like Professor Ronan said, this in two levels, the symbolical level and the pragmatic one. And I do think that the biggest problem to achieve any kind of peace solution, not only in Middle East, but also precisely in Jerusalem, that we are, what we are talking here right now, it's because we overvalue Jerusalem's solution and we understand Jerusalem only from the symbolical perspective and only by the religious perspective. Of course, Jerusalem is crucial. It's important, obviously. It's, uh, but to, to understand what is happening right now in Jerusalem as a religious problem, that is the problem. I will start saying, uh, I think it was maybe in 90, 19, 1919, a famous French poet and philosopher called Paul Valéry asked, uh, he was writing something on, uh, about Europe, actually it was a lecture called Penser l'Europe. And so someone asked him, uh, uh, what is the spirit of Europe? And she asked uh, uh, in a very simple question about the spirit of Europe. So Europe is Athens, it's Rome, and it's Jerusalem. I know very well the three cities. If you go to Athens and Rome, you'll find archaeology. But if you go to Jerusalem, you also find much more than archaeology. You don't have archaeology there. So things remain there, in the flesh. And why do things remain in the flesh? Because definitely we try to read and to take advantage of a political problem uh, uh, lifting symbolic and religious banners. And so that's the problem. And actually, all the Middle East is trying to, uh, uh, we try to read the tensions of the Middle East according to this perspective. But it's not. So, in my opinion, we have at least two main tools to understand what is happening in the Middle East. What I mean with that is that Jerusalem is not the main problem of the Middle East. Because when we analyze the Middle East situation, we are always focused on the Palestinian and Israeli conflict, on the, on the problem of Jerusalem. The problem of the Middle East is much more than that. And by the way, in the beginning of the problem of both states, or in the beginning of the problem of Jerusalem, I'm talking about the 20th century, there was no religion problem there. PLO was a secular movement. George Abash was a Marxist-Leninist. Where is Islam there? The problem starts to be Islamized in the 80s, mostly with Hamas. But okay, let's put this aside and then let's go to the Middle East. So to understand Middle East, in my opinion, or at least the tensions in the Middle East, you have at least two, two main tools. The first is to understand that one of the biggest problems of the Middle East is the definition of the frontiers. And then we, you, we, we, can, we can go uh, to sykes Pico Treaty, we can even watch uh, Lawrence of Arabia to understand what is happening, or why one of the biggest problems of the Middle East is frontiers. See what's happening right now in Syria, in Iraq, with Turkey, that is trying to redesign a new, uh, a new Ottoman uh, 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 strategy, trying to pick up some parts of the Ottoman Empire. Iran, so everything could be read as a frontier problem. Right now, the problem of Palestine and Israel, also a problem of, of frontier. So this is the first tool. The second tool where we can, or, or how we can read the problems of the Middle East, is the ideological dimension. What I mean with the ideological dimension, because if you read what's happening in the Middle East, since at least the 30s of the 20th century, you will see that the power is being distributed by or nationalists or Islamists. So, you can read things in this perspective. But besides those two tools, I can think that there are five principles, or at least four principles, that will help us to understand what is going on in the Middle East. And if I say those four principles, you will see that Jerusalem 
is a lesser problem to solve the problems or the tensions in the Middle East. And you also will understand that religious, or understand this from a symbolic perspective or a religious perspective, is the main problem to solve this problem. So, you will have the five principles, the four principles at least, a mutation of Islamism, because we'll see in those last 30 years, you will find a mutation of the Islamism, and the last mutation which was mainly after the Arab Spring. The second one is the collapse of the states after the Arab Spring. The third one is the new frontiers that are arising right now in the Middle East. And the fourth is the new alliance that are arousing right now in the Middle East. And I only have one minute. And so for the new frontiers, or sorry, for the new alliances that are arousing right now in the Middle East, I will, I will, I will talk with you about Trump's decision about Jerusalem. And you will see an example of the new frontiers. What I mean with that? In my opinion, the decision of put of of of, of what define Jerusalem as the capital of Israel by Donald Trump had only one objective: to compromise Israel, to compromise Israel only to pull Israel to establish a new alliance or an improbable alliance with Sunni states and Arab states to create a common front against a common enemy, which is Iran. So as you can see, Jerusalem and religion is a lesser problem of the Middle East, and you sh we should never understand the tensions of the Middle East with those two things. Thank you very much. And I think I will Thank you, Felipe. I learned a new trick. As soon as your time ends, say I have only two minutes. <laughs> and you bought yourself two or extra minutes. Nice one. <laughs> he was at 5.40, 5 minutes 40 seconds when he said that. <laughs> Our next speaker is Dr. Ikram Masmudi. She's an associate professor at the University of Delaware. She teaches the Arabic language. She is established an Arabic studies program at the university. She also translates Iraqi literature, especially women's literature, written under the sad environment of the war into English. But above all, she's also my ustada. So every now and then when I need to refresh my Arabic, I go and sit in her classes. And I found that, you know, teaching Arabic language, teaching grammar is very easy. But teaching vocabulary in Arabic is extremely tough. And uh, Professor Nasbudi is one of the few teachers of Arabic. You can recognize by that phrase that I've had many <laughs> who's very good at teaching uh, vocabulary. Thank you very much, but I'll have you. Thank you, Muqtadir. Thank you all. Thank you to our speakers, all our speakers. Well, um, I have two questions. I'm go going to formulate what I was, what I was, what I had prepared into two questions to our main speaker. The first question, I agree with the speaker that there are two paths for discussion. It's either we talk about symbols, narratives, beliefs, or we engage into you know paths of pragmatism and practical solutions. And it seems that I think we have tried both paths. Both the Israelis and the Palestinians, they have tried to advance you know, their symbolic connections, their narratives, and, their, uh, and the importance of Jerusalem to both parties. And at the same time, both parties have engaged in pragmatism, in lengthy peace process that have led to nowhere so far. So I would like to remind our speaker that when it comes to the Palestinian connection to Jerusalem, it is not just about symbols or beliefs. 
even though we know, we all know how strong that connection is. I'm not going, I'm not going to remind us of how that Jerusalem is the first Qibla of the Muslims or how, you know, Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa importance and uh, the Qubba Al-Sahra importance for all Muslims. Let that aside. What I'm going to remind us uh, about is the history. Let alone the archaeology. I'm going just to stick to the history. 13 centuries of almost uninterrupted history. How can you ask a people to relinquish such a history and to get it managed by another entity? Who can do that? How can we ask the Palestinians to just give up? Yeah, give up the, all, this, all this history, give it up. Let it be managed by our friends, the Israelis. In the atmosphere of mistrust, how can we entrust Israel of the good management of all that heritage? I think we are asking the Palestinians so much there. The second point that I would like to make is that um, our speaker, our main speaker um, first said, well, we didn't wait for President Trump's decision to declare that uh, Jerusalem is the capital of Israel, of Israel. We have, indeed, the founders of Israel have decided and have you know, proclaimed unilaterally, of course, that Jerusalem is the capital of Israel. But then, if that is the case, how did we mislead the international community? How did we mislead peoples? How did we mislead the Palestinians into negotiations, into Oslo? Oslo peace process put the question of Jerusalem to the very end. You know, it was supposed to be discussed, you know, with, within the final status uh, issues, including refugees, the issue of water, etc., etc. If that was the case, okay, so Jerusalem has been dismissed, postponed, and then, you know, you see the contradiction of having secured unilateral Jerusalem as a capital and then mislead the people, mislead the taxpayers, because all those negotiations for all those years, they have been conducted with our money, our taxpayer money, years and years and years. You see, the, I see here a dishonesty, I see a mistrust, here's the mistrust, if we want to point, put our finger on the point of mistrust, it is easy to be located there. So I think President Trump's decision is one of the most misguided decisions ever made by a president of a country that is supposed to broker peace between the two entities. And I think the Palestinians are entitled to mistrust you know, the United States and to seek other international communities and other peace brokers in order to achieve the peace and the justice that the Palestinian people are so entitled to. Thank you very much. Oh, wow. The Palestinians are now entitled to mistrust the United States and seek alternatives. That's a very powerful statement. And now I want to call my friend John Elzefon, who is one of the... I don't know whether you know this, but I'm the most handsome Muslim in Delaware, and he's the most handsome Jew in Delaware. And that is the basis of our connection. <laughs> he's in New Jersey. <laughs> so, uh, without much ado, he's a distinguished lawyer, very powerful individual in the state, and he's also the leader of the Jewish Federation of... Yeah, we'll get to that. And so without much ado, John has the phone. Salam <laughs> alaikum. Um, one thing Greg Jones says I have to contest. He's not the oldest person up here to me. Um, I'm the chair of the Jewish Community Relations Committee for the state of Delaware. 
that position is one which I relish, and in that position I am an unapologetic advocate of the right of Israel to exist and its right to exist as a Jewish state. Now I draw a distinction between that role of mine and the role of certain Israeli governmental policies. Um, I don't advocate strongly for their policies or speak for them. I can't even get a straight answer at my own breakfast table on what the role should be of certain Israeli policies. Um, and I certainly don't speak in support of the United States government, although I do not believe that the decision by President Trump is as bad as some have made it out to be. What is clear to me is that Jerusalem is a holy city to three faiths. Um, the Muslims here, of course, know its involvement in the night journey of the prophet. But as I understand it, and if I'm wrong, I will be clear, it will be told to me, it's also the place where your tradition teaches that Abraham was about to sacrifice his son Ishmael. Of course, in the Jewish faith, it's Isaac. Religiously, that rock, which of course is the center of the Dome of the Rock, the beautiful building built in 691, is what we call the found, the Jews call the foundation stone. In our tradition, it is the place where God began to create the earth. And the hole in the foundation stone is the place where God reached in and took dust and made the fused human atom. It is, of course, holy to Christians, as Greg Jones, Pastor Jones said, and I don't have to repeat what he did, said. There are some who state that because the Koran does not mention Jerusalem by name, it's really not that important to the Muslim world, and I'm a Jew who rejects that premise. It is holy to your faith, and I get it, I understand it. One of the things that's important here is the issue of trust. I think we've hit the nail on the head when people talk about trust. There is a fundamental lack of trust in the present climate. And if one were to read Mahmoud Abbas's statement to the Palestinian Council of January 14, 2018, and if you approach this from the mindset of the Jewish people and Israelis, it will send a chill down your back. Those of you who favor the Palestinian approach might find comfort in it, but those of us who have a different viewpoint find it horrifying, to say the least. Talked about preconditions. There's been a statement that everything should be on the table. One thing that I do not think can be on the table is whether Israel has a right to exist. Some may disagree with that, but I don't think that can be a precondition. Israel, by the way, is the only nation on this planet whose choice of where a capital should be has been challenged. Israel, is the, Israel, when it tries to negotiate and wants to involve the other Arab countries, has to deal with the fact that 22 members of the Arab League still don't recognize her right to exist. And of course, Iran certainly doesn't. And by the way, for all the importance of Jerusalem to the Middle East peace and all the importance of having the Palestinians and the Israelis come together in some form, um, I'm a believer that the fundamental threat to peace is Iran, especially a nuclear Iran. That scares me more than anything else. There's nothing about that that I think is going to be helpful. Now, I'm also a firm believer that the average Israeli, regardless of religion, and the average Palestinian, regardless of religion, absolutely want peace. Um, one can laundry list the are you my word, misdeeds of the Israelis as the Palestinians. And one can, on the other hand, counter that with a laundry list of the misdeeds of the Palestinians against the Israelis. There are people on both sides who have committed horrible things to the other. Um, as a Jew, I find it hard to understand why the Palestinians pay money to the many women they consider martyrs for killing Israelis. Um, as a Jew, I am also very disturbed about the rise of the right-wing Haredi. 
Um, so there are issues on both sides. <coughs> there are religious zealots. Um, how am I doing on time? Yeah, one and a half minutes. One and a half minutes. Okay. Um, <laughs> the uh, I'm going to, you know, go a few things. There was a few things to counter. There was mention about the the um, involvement of APAC. APAC has a strong position, but there are only six or seven million Jews in this country. Um, the strongest Zionist force are the evangelical Christians, of which there are almost 100 million. So, when you, this is why, of course, why this is an important matter to consider. I agree with the statement that while Jerusalem is important, it is not the central issue involved. And, for example, President Trump's announcement had this sentence in it. I don't know how many read everything he said. Uh, quote, we are not taking any position on any final status issues, including the specific boundaries of Israeli sovereignty in Jerusalem or the resolution of contested borders. Those are up to the people involved. Whether you agree or disagree with what he said, he did not foreclose Jerusalem as a part of a state of Palestine and did not foreclose <coughs> the existence of a state of Palestine. I think my time is up. Uh, thank you for the invitation. But he immediately went ahead and tweeted that I have taken Jerusalem off the table. Which he so his last tweet on Jerusalem sort of contradicted the statement. I wish Donald Trump would read what his staff has write about his policy, then we would have less of a mess. Uh, I'm going to give three minutes to my dear friend Ronan to deal with the entire world. <laughs> Just three minutes, uh, and uh, and then we will open it up for question and answers. Four people have already sent me their names, uh, so Ronan. <clears throat> thank, thank you very much, thank you very much for the speakers. Well, I have only three minutes, and uh, instead of dealing with the entire world, I prefer to respond to you, Mr. Bender. I was standing here for 20 minutes, trying to avoid blaming one side and justify only the other side. I think it's totally simplistic to draw a picture where one side is to blame for everything. And unfortunately, you chose to do that. I mean, I respect the fact that you, we all come here and speak, but now you force me to answer. So let me give you the balance. Should I remind you who is accepted and who rejected the original uh, uh, resolution by the United Nations of 29 of November 1947? Should I remind you, you mentioned that I was part of Benjamin Netanyahu's government. I was, although I'm in the opposition, but we were, you know, we were in a coalition. In what you say, it's false democracy. So there is a real democracy, and I was in the government of Netanyahu. But you know what? I've been in the government of Itzhak Rabin. And we sat with Yasser Arafat and we negotiated peace and we got a wave of terrorism and suicide bombing not only in the streets of Jerusalem, also in the streets of Tel Aviv, in the streets of Haifa, in the streets of everywhere. That's what we got in exchange for peace. I also sat in the, in the government, or I, I helped the Prime Minister Ehud Barak, who gave Yasser Arafat, offered Yasser Arafat almost everything he demanded. Again, wave of terrorism, wave, wave of suicide bombing. So, what I want to say, the situation is complicated. There are both two sides at least, I think there are more than two sides. And I think the most counterproductive and the less constructive thing that one can do is to draw that simplistic picture as if there is one occupier and one victim. I know personally kids who were killed in those terror attacks. There is one occupier. Kids who were there is one occupier. So if you want to teach me a lesson, teach me a lesson. But that's exactly what I learned from the Americans, which is called fake news. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank 
you very much. I'm now going to open this up for Q&A. Uh, the best time to have interfaith dialogue, the only time is now Sunday afternoons, because of Friday is holy to Muslim Sabbath, etc., etc. So since neither it is Friday nor Sunday, so no khutbas, no preaching, no long statements. <laughs> so just make quick comments and questions. Uh, I, I will. I have now six names here, so I will tell you what the names are in that order. Uh, number one, Mustafa Tanja. Number two, Brian Townsend. Number three, Paul Bombach. Number four, Tim Kerstetter. Number five, Edward Carl from Wilmington. And Brian Hammers. Hammerstrand, Hammerstrand. So these are the six names that I have so far. So the first question, do you want to use the mic? Thank you, I wasn't prepared for this, but uh, I would like to say a few things. First of all, thank you very much for uh, this, such a nice event. Uh, I'm not going to talk too much or I'm not, I'm not going to ask too many questions to you. The, you mentioned uh, clearly shouldn't have any uh, precondition. Okay, if we say there is no precondition based on the map of 1946 or based on the map of the 1947 or based on the map of the 2018, this is very important. And also, uh, Professor Philip, right? Okay, uh, you said let's look at the Middle East not uh, based on the religion. There is a lot of politics going on. <coughs> and also you mentioned some of the countries' names like the Iran, Turkey, and others like Saudi Arabia. Okay, those are the countries who are really the suffering the, because of the problems of the Middle East. Like I'm a Turkish-American, so I'm kind of like offensive. The, the mention you said like Nevo Toman. Uh, and you are from Portugal, right? And I'm, very, I'm traveling to South America very often, and the Brazil is the, the largest and the wealthiest and the, the biggest country in South America. And it was occupied or conquered by Portugal, and the entire Brazil is speaking right now Portuguese. Yes, the Ottoman Empire was very large, and none of the territories, the, you know, the occupied by the Ottoman, Ottoman Empire never changed their religion, never changed their languages. So I believe you should look at it from that perspective also. Anyway, yes, the peace has to come. And thank you very much. You said at least we would like to sit together. We are ready to sit together and uh, discuss about that uh, subject. Uh, I believe the, the Israeli uh, side should be uh, should approach like with the more empathy to Palestinians. I'm I'm none of the side. Yes, I'm a Muslim, but I'm a Turkish. So I'm not an Arab. I'm not a uh, Jew. I'm a Turkish, and when I look at from the Turkish American perspective, the negotiation should start based on the United Nations orders. At least the entire world, you know, should understand. This is a this is a big giving without saying the, the land is belong to this religion or that religion. The United Nations orders accepted from all nations. That's why we call United Nations. If the, do, you, do you believe the Israel is ready to talk based on the United Nations orders? That's all my question. Thank you. Uh, we will keep, let's go to all the questions, so then at the end, if the panel wishes to speak, uh, uh, respond. Uh, Brian? Brian Townsend is, like I said, a state senator. Thank you, Dr. Khan. Thank you very much, everyone, and welcome to the 11th Senatorial District. Um, also, assalamu alaikum. Always a pleasure to be with the community, truly one of the most vibrant, uh, kind, caring, compassionate, active communities in the state of Delaware. Um, and that's before you reach out and assemble the kind of interfaith group that you have today. Um, I know that I, I've been asked to comment briefly on President Trump's announcement with regard to the, to the embassy, and I'll, I'll do that. Uh, I also just want to emphasize, and obviously 
people don't all agree with what you know some of the things have been said the past 45 minutes or an hour or so but if, if we if we keep it at the level of tension that we've seen just in the past few minutes and don't go far beyond that I think it speaks so well to the kind of interfaith <laughs> collaborative conversations that Delaware in my experience the past couple of years in particular has become known for and is extremely important to maintain at this point notwithstanding different levels of agreement on the different issues um, I think it really just speaks so well that Delaware seems to be able to have those conversations at a time when other areas of our country can't, um, when other areas of the world can't. I think it's very, very important for Delaware to, to maintain that. So no surprise if, if we are able to, though, I think so highly of the different leaders in the different communities. Um, as, to, as to what President Trump did, uh, it's my understanding that everyone officially agrees that uh, any any announce, any decision with regard to the embassy should have been made as part of a negotiation process. Whether you think it should or shouldn't have been moved, I guess every the official position of every group is it should be part of a, of a negotiating process. Um, you know, I think for me the biggest issue is the fact that I don't see President Trump as being any kind of person successful of making any deals whatsoever that involve sort of win wins on all sides. <laughs> If by some stroke of luck this turns out to have been a genius move that sparks some kinds of conversation that results in long-term peace and a two-state solution, then perhaps most people in this room, I'm sure not all people in this room, but most people in this room might look back and say, oh, geez, you know, how about that? Maybe in hindsight we all feel differently. But I happen to think that our, our president is a person whose history shows that he has somehow, over the course of several decades, made steps in advance, usually in the backs of other people, rather than kind of finding wins, win wins that can be at the heart of business negotiations and can be at the heart, of, certainly is at the heart of diplomacy. Um, and so for me, the biggest issue is not even necessarily um, how it was announced, but the fact that there's no track record whatsoever uh, as, as a per, and over his career and then also as a president. Um, it just seems to be another whimsical move by him to try and spark whatever uh, conflagration and whatever burning process will then, you know, from, from the ashes will rise something. This is kind of how he governs. And I just think for, for one of the most key issues, not only politically and geopolitically, but as has been talked about tonight to a large extent, theologically, spiritually, to use that as some kind of flippant bargaining chip, or not even a bargaining chip, I think that's part of the part of the issue, right? Not even a bargaining chip, just an announcement followed up by a tweet. I mean, I just think that it is just so sad that he would do that, given the real tensions, the valid tensions, and the dire, dire need to find resolution on questions that have not been solved for so many years and so many decades, with so many innocent people caught in between. Um, so I don't think it was a productive move as a state senator. Uh, it's not something that I have any any input into whatsoever. Um, our congressional delegation are, are the ones who have to find some way of trying to deal um, with, uh, with, with President Trump. But it does matter when uh, so much of Delaware's Muslim community is located in or just on the border of my senatorial district and when Delaware's Muslim community has been so fantastic in inviting different elected officials to come and participate and, and join the community uh, so, many, so many times. Um, <laughs> Again, I think tonight represents the, the best of that, and um, I appreciate the opportunity to speak, um, but most importantly the opportunity to listen on a, yet again a diverse set of thoughts um, on one of the key, key issues in our globe and throughout our entire history, and hopeful that, that there can be some kind of resolution, um, obviously not in this room in terms of the policies that we need to see, but in the halls of governments, because um, I think we're almost at a point now, even at the right young or old age of 36 for me, um, where you just sit and wonder how are we yet in a whole other generation now where we haven't made progress and in fact maybe have, have, have backslid in some ways. Um, I just don't, I don't see how and I certainly know my generation isn't, that's not how we think about things. Um, and yet we seem to be in a situation now where the U.S. president has put us all the, all the worse in it. Um, so you would hope there could be a, not only a two-state solution but a true embrace, a true shared common embrace of a shared common city. Um, I don't. I don't see how any result, how any true, a truly lasting peace can involve anything different than that. Um, I don't see, frankly see how common sense and common decency can involve anything different than that. Uh, as difficult as difficult as it is to achieve, um, and hopefully we can agree on that. Thank you all for being part of the uh, the dialogue, and again, thank you to the um, the leaders in Delaware's Muslim community for I think across the nation being a role model 
offer how to, to, to spark interfaith conversations very productively uh, at this very critical time in our country's history. Thank you. Brian and I are often on forums together, and I always miss uh, introducing him. I always say, sometimes I say Governor Townsend, sometimes I say President Townsend. <laughs> Inshallah. Uh, Thank you all for, for this event. Thank you all for participating in this event. Um, I am incredibly, to admit I'm just plain incredibly ignorant of the issues anywhere near the depth of each of you, and frankly I think many in the audience. Um, and therefore I think I have benefited the most from this because I've learned so much. But I don't, I get frustrated when all I'm learning are problems and no solutions. Um, and so I do want to pose a question, um, and for perhaps a piece of it can be addressed um, during time afterwards. And, and I want to direct it to Dr. Hoffman, thank you for being here, um, and to uh, Rabbi Krantz and Mr. Elzefan, if you would. Um, my understanding, I, I, you know, I'm looking for the solution. We know we've got a problem here, and we know that it, there's quite a distance to the solution. And I think one of the things that came up with some of the other comments were, it is difficult to have negotiations when there's a big power difference. We heard this very loudly yesterday at the Women's March. We have half of our country's population who were at a very inferior power position for hundreds of years in this country, and still are. Um, and so my question is, what is the path that you see? And I get that there's, we shouldn't be narrowly focused on a bilateral um, process, and it should be multilateral. But within the two main parties, how do, we, how do we approach the dialogue that can be most constructive when those two parties have so much inequality between their starting positions. So I'd appreciate your insight on that, and thank you for uh, putting up with me today. Thanks. We have to play tennis one of these days, Paul. Yes, we do. We, we have. Uh, uh, I, I'm temporarily closing the questions with the last one acknowledged. Uh, so that I can give some minutes to the respondents, and we have uh, a closing statement and a prayer before we move to prayer. So the next question is from Edward Call. Edward Call from Wilmington, Delaware. And then after that, Brian. So if you could move closer, Brian. Yeah. Well, I'm happy to see so many people came out to hear this, and we had such wonderful speakers with these depth of insights and aspirations and honesty. And I just want to say I don't hold a political office. I'm an independent. I'm proud of it. I don't, I don't belong to a party because I think we have a problem with both our parties have failed leadership. But as a citizen, I... And in another sense, I think I have the highest office in this country. Citizens of this country have to take responsibility for the policies of our nation state. We have a party system that doesn't work. But what I'm seeing is there are other voices around the entire planet that are putting a solution on the table, not just for the Middle East, uh, not just for the United States, not just for Africa, <laughs> And these, they're not being invited to the table. We have a mass media that lies to us too much. And the other countries may have this problem too. And we still have some freedom, but maybe it's more on the internet today because most presses doesn't, you don't ever have a free press anymore. But we can get it back if we want to. But we have to desire that. The solution, in my view, as a humble citizen, and I used, you know, and, I, and there's also another, <laughs> I want to say this, that Israel and, and Jerusalem and Haifa are holy to other faiths too. It's not just these three. There are other faiths 
that also see this as a very holy place. And they need to be have a role on the table too, I believe. But my, what I want to say very briefly is that there is a policy been put on the table in the last 50 years, and now more intensively in the last few years, which is called, in Chinese they're calling it the One Belt, One Road. And what they're saying is that everybody should join together where everybody benefits. It's not winner take all. Winner take all failed. That's the system of empire. Divide and conquer. We call it geopolitics. After World War II, we didn't rebuild the world. We divided it. And I'm not just the U.S. The U.S. isn't the big, only bad guy. <laughs> we went on the wrong track because we weren't sure of our principles. And if we're going to get peace in the world, any place in the world, we need to work together to develop the entire planet and to eliminate poverty from this planet. If we don't do this, we will destroy ourselves. So it's up to us to decide whether we want to do that, <laughs> whether we want to get our country's government to function in the interest of all people on the whole planet, not just our country. Because we're in this together. It's like we're in the same boat. <laughs> it's like Noah's Ark, okay? Sink or swim here. We either unify for the common aims of all mankind. And why? What is the sacred principle of all these religions? Every single child born, he hasn't been corrupted yet. <laughs> she hasn't been corrupted yet. Every single child born is born with a sacred gift, a creative power of, of discovery. We call this the divine spark. Every religion holds this as the fundamental bedrock, every, every Bible. We need to make that the fundamental policy principle, and everything else will flow in a fruitful manner. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Brian? Brian? Yeah, I'm glad there are a lot of people here from the community. I'm a, a Quaker, uh, active in uh, Philadelphia Yearly Meeting. My wife and I were Peace Corps volunteers in Tunisia. I spoke many 35 years ago. I spoke a little Arabic. We were visiting in Amman during the massacres in Sabra and Shatila. I uh, was in the government tourist office in Amman and uh, the tourism assistant, as uh, uh, under minister, called me into his office and said, I'm a Palestinian, as are more than half the people of Jordan. He said, all my life I've taught my children um, to believe in a two-state solution, but we can't have it. Now I'm going to, um, now is, but we need total war. And I said, well, you'll be happy to know I'm going to chain myself to the American embassy gate in protest of American support of Israel. And he threw himself against the door and said, I won't let you leave until you abandon this mad plan. They'll rip your arms off. So he said, this is not a democracy. So that's my background. I have two questions, one for each side. We all know Turkey won't allow the word genocide, but that's what they did to the Kurds at the end of World War I, and they're still paying for that. And Israel needs to acknowledge the historical fact of the expulsion. And I don't think there can be any peace just as Germany made its apologies, Germany rewrote its history book to admit its guilt in World War II and make a reparations and apologies. Turkey has never done that, and Israel is going the way of Turkey. There has to be an apology and an acknowledgement of history. But then, as I saw in Tunisia, the Arab world, partly funded by the Wahhabi fundamentalists from Saudi Arabia, are buying a horrible misinterpretation of Islam that ignores the people of the book, that ignores the fact that Christians and Jews share the faith, the Abrahamic faith, and, and have made thousands of young people into non-Muslim terrorists. And so I think both sides, I ask both sides, to look at your part 
in this sad situation. Uh, yeah, I got it. Uh, I think we should start with Americans apologizing to the world for unleashing Trump on the rest. We should first apologize for unleashing Trump on the rest of the world. Okay, <laughs> that's more dangerous. Uh, it's, it's amazing to notice that this Khutba disease is interfaith. Uh, Dawood, <laughs> Dawood, Brother Dawood, Asad, uh, the writer of Palestine Rising, you have, believe it or not, minus 30 seconds. <laughs> Just to show you from where I came, I was born, born in Jerusalem. I lived all my life in Jerusalem in a, in a village about four miles west of Jerusalem called Deir Yassin. And you know in Deir Yassin a big massacre took place on 9 April 1948. I am one of the survivors. So what I did here, I made my book, Palestine Rising, show the significance of Jerusalem to all faiths and have recon reconciliation. I said two point two things. The Jews say in Talmud, a verse say that if you save one soul as if you save the whole the whole humanity, and if you kill one as if the whole community. In the Quran we have the same thing exactly. So I tell them if this is the case, why don't we sit down here and make make us a uh, uh, peace so that we would save those Israelis and Palestinians who are going to be killed later on. Because look at Japan here, what happened here. We, we, we fought Japan and everything, now we are friendly for Japan, but all those people, they got killed. I'm a peace man, okay? Although I, I lost my grandmother 97, 96 years of age and my brother Omar two years of her age for massacre, 27 of my family, but I still I need peace to, to uh, make, make peace happen. And also, I was there in 1993. I was there in, in Rabi and Arafat when he, when he... Now, in five years, supposed to have our Palestine. 1999, what happened? Nothing, you see? So what's, what kind of uh, resolution we have? Okay, time is up. Okay, I just want to say that anybody who wants my book in here, yes, I'm not saying it, I'm saying it, this compliment for you here, to know exactly what happened in Palestine, the Zionism and so forth, and our friend here, he says about Ben-Gurion, how can he, somebody give somebody else to other people who does not belong to him? Palestine does not belong. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum. <laughs> He didn't use the word, but what he said was that he's willing to forgive in the interest of peace. I have two questions and two people who have volunteered to respond. One second each, uh, Professor Hussein from Pakistan, followed by Dr. Uh, followed by Shahid Badra, the president of the university. Come on in. Quick. <laughs> Peshawar University in Pakistan. Hello everyone. Uh, uh, just to make a, a brief comment uh, about the way oh yeah, I had the same idea. <laughs> about the way things are going on. Uh, first thing is, it's really quite uh, uh, unethical at this moment from the point of view of international relations to speak about a country that has existed in the last 68 years, stating that it would be decimated, it would be banished. That is not that, that doesn't carry sense at the moment. Number one. Number two important thing is that that uh, uh, we need to understand that uh, Muslims in the last uh, 68 years have they've completely failed to fetch Palestine by force. Four big wars and very badly defeated. One thing. Second thing, but at the same time, Israelis have really very badly failed to keep Palestine with themselves. So the need of the time at the moment is what our speaker spoke, that is two-state solution. And the third important thing, we are talking a lot about uh, Palestine. Yes, I understand all of us are non-state actors and we are speaking about it. Do you know what our states are doing, by the way? How many Muslim countries are there standing with Palestinians? Number one. Number two, why we have left Palestinians to Palestinians? Oh, listen, let me answer that. Palestinians are left to, Palestine is left to Palestinians and that's it then. Thank you very much. This is what it says, what it should be then. So, the third gentleman who came over and asked a very good question, how negotiations will happen between the two unequals? We could have made the other small, weak party equal had there been 57 countries with it. They have left them to themselves. 
And if they have left them to themselves, that's, that's what is the principle of international relations, which says, and I quote Nietzsche, uh, a great philosopher of uh, German, and I, I'm finishing it. He says that to be weak is to be criminal. So the one who is weak will face the music, and they are facing. Thank you very much. All right, one quick comment. So, Bajwa, and then two respondents, and then we move towards the closing session, which require another two sessions. So don't run away on me. I sound like Peace be upon all of you. Including Dr. Hoffman. You see how peaceful people we are. We're happy, happy to have you with us. And I hope that one day Palestinian will be sitting with you like this. It's not a question about um, the Jerusalem. Jerusalem belongs to 1.7 billion Muslims. And I believe uh, we should respect each other's religion and their rights. Another bothering thing is that killing of innocent Palestinians. Like uh, yesterday news, 12 Palestinians was killed in front of the tunnel by Israelis, you know. And I believe as a human being, you should consider this one, you know. We are hurting, you know, very much. I know, I was, I was uh, surprised when President Trump announced the capital uh, of Israel will be Jer Jerusalem. It reminded me one uh, news that I was watching, he was coming out on the plane. When he stepped down, he started walking this way. An officer said, sir, where are you going? He said, I'm going to my limousine. He said, no, your limousine is this side. You know, so he, he was confused, you know. So I believe his step was promoting the terrorism. Thank you, sir. I finished right now. Thank you very much. <laughs> well, uh, I want to call Dr. Salim Khan to express thanks. And he has something to share very quickly. And uh, time is running out not just for us, but for the Palestinians too. Uh, some years back, and I was uh, impressed by the severity and the nature of the conflict that you heard a lot about today, I wrote this poem, which I'm going to share with you. It has been published in many books and magazines. This is one of them. The title of the poem is... Yes. When is that going to stop? More violence, more deceit, more destruction, more violence, more destruction. It goes on and on. There is no end to it. When is that going to stop? A suicide bomber blows himself up, killing many Israelis with him. Then more attacks on Palestinian soil. A few more people get killed. Then the Palestinians retaliate. When is that going to stop? They have been fighting for generations. Innocent lives are being lost. And homes are getting destroyed. When is that going to stop? They are forced to talk with each other. They may be... There may be temporary relief, but the killing starts again. When is that going to stop? They are caught in a vicious cycle. Violence and revenge dominate their lives, diminishing hope for peace. When is that going to stop? Animosity has been there for years. Feelings of revenge are strong. I pray they stop the violence and embrace each other. I hope they create a peaceful future for themselves and future generations. Thank you very much. Before I invite Imam Shibli to pray for Jerusalem and for peace in the area, I want to announce that on February 3rd, on Saturday, we have another such session, and we're going to tackle another challenge, which is peace in South Asia, Indo-Pak relations. We have Dr. Sanjay, who's right here, Bhatwaj, who will be speaking on, he's from Jawaharlal Nehru University in Delhi, he will be speaking perhaps from the Indian perspective, and we have Dr. Sayyid Hussain Sohrawardi, who is from University of Peshawar, he will speak 
speaking from the Pakistani perspective. So make sure that you lock the time, February 3rd, Saturday, at this spot. Uh, and now I invite Imam Shibli to pray. Before we pray, there was a scholar giving lectures in a university, and a young man came to him and said, Sir, can you pray for me to grow up my beard? Looks like my friend there. To be similar to your beard, the scholar said to a Muslim scholar, not make a joke about anybody except about Muslims, sorry. <laughs> The Muslim scholar said to him, where is the microphone? Uh, the Muslim scholar said to him, no, I'm not going to pray for you. He said, please, I am one of your followers, I attend your lectures, I go to uh, Facebook, I know you everywhere, can you pray for me? He said, no, I'm not going to pray for you. After three times, the scholar asked the student, can you tell me why you are not going to pray for me? I will answer you. The student repeated the question, he said, why you are not praying for me? He said, sir, if I pray for you every morning, may God help you to grow your beard, to be similar to my nice beard, yes? And you go to the mirror every morning and you shave your beard by, you know, the knife. Which one God will accept? The shaving, which means you know her, or my prayer? Is that okay? Say no. No. Now, yes, I am going to pray for peace in Delaware. I'm going to pray to Allah, God, to have a peace in Masjid Isa ibn Maryam. I'm going to pray to God to grant us peace in our 50 state of United States of America, because we are here. I'm going to pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide our leaders in Washington DC to put them on the straight path. And I did that 2014 when I opened the Congress for prayer, just for commercial. I pray to God to transfer the peace from here. After crossing the, the, the ocean 6,000 miles from all the region, and I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless all of us, male, female, imam, rabbi, guest, Everybody attend this meeting, and finally, I pray to Allah to make other masjid. We just came from Masjid Ibrahim, we visit Masjid Ibrahim, other synagogue, other churches, to adopt the same podium, same gathering, and may God create a peace in the house of God and everywhere. Ameen, thumma ameen, thumma ameen. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you, ma'am. We are adjourned. Thank you.
سمي الله لمن حمده الله أكبر سمي الله لمن حمده الله أكبر سمع الله حميدا الله أكبر
السلام عليكم ورحمة الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله
This one here? Yeah, this one here. Yeah. Only this? take this one. Yeah. Okay. I need some help from somebody, I don't know. Only this one, okay? Huh? You only this one. This one? No, no, this is the last one, no more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <coughs>